So the 12 Pro Max, when it came out, had its own uniquely advanced camera module, while the 13 Pro and Pro Max share the same, larger yet brighter module, which gives you about the equivalent of half a stop reduction in depth of field. So the camera module in the 12 Pro Max should be quite similar to that used in the non-Pro 13s. So here you can see contrasting the two camera modules from the same generation, one in the Pro model and one in the non-Pro model. So the 13 Pro supports ProRes recording while the non-Pro doesn't. And just like with ProRaw, I'm guessing because the rest of the hardware is the same, that these are just software limitations to differentiate the Pro line from the non-Pros and that there's not any intrinsic difference or limitation in the hardware that would prevent it. Do you notice any difference in sharpness? I'm guessing the compression is just gonna wipe away any detail anyway, so let's push in. Let me know if you see any difference. The difference in the camera seems even less pronounced when you're using cinematic mode. And the pros with the absolutely larger aperture for the given focal length may give you a slight advantage. It may, in some cases, look a little bit more natural, but most of the time, any difference is gonna be washed out by the computational blurring effect. But is that really something you want? The cinematic is being shot at 1080 because that's the only resolution it supports. Cropping in, do you see any perceptible difference in quality? How natural does it look? Let me know in the comments. And this video is being shot at 30 frames per second for the first time on this channel, again, because that's the only frame rate that's supported by cinematic mode. These two cameras now should be fairly similar at 4K 30. My first video that I shot on this channel, actually the first two uh, that I uploaded, were shot on the iPhone 10. Actually, this one to which I'm talking to right now. The aspect of the video recording that bothered me the most about those in hindsight, compared to say the BGH1 or the R6, wasn't the color produced or you know a lot of those qualities. It's just the, the blocky over-processed video output that it just looked unnaturally smooth with the compression. Similarly, the JPEGs were overly smoothed as well if you're looking at them on anything larger than a phone screen. Unless you use a third-party app that would capture the raw DNG, but then you are also forgoing all of Apple's computational goodness. Have the subsequent generations improved things? Does Pro Raw introduced with the iPhone 12 Pro resolve the still image resolution issue? What about ProRes introduced with the 13 Pro? Does it do the same thing for video? How has the hardware itself improved? What, if anything, are you giving up if you decide to go for the model that fits in your pocket? So let's take a deeper look at the iPhone 13 cameras. And so far we've been looking at the iPhone 13 Pro Max and the iPhone 13 mini. So the two extreme lines of the iPhone 13 range. But unlike last year where there was a difference between the 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Max, the 13 keeps the same camera hardware within its designated lines. The Pro and Pro Max share the same hardware and the non-Pro models share the same hardware. Before going on, I want to apologize. Apparently the iPhone 13 mini's non-cinematic footage in the intro actually shot at 24 frames per second. So any comparative lack of fluidity is because of that, which obviously throws off the comparison there. But since I no longer have all the phones, well, we'll see how good my NLE is at converting it. I guess this video is for the three people who are interested in the new iPhone 13 series, but didn't order one back in September, or maybe you're anxiously awaiting your backordered phone given chip shortages and power cuts in China and watching everything you can about why the iPhone 13 or the iPhone 13 Pro is the best iPhone ever. I mean, that's obvious. Even if incremental, each iPhone series has been an improvement. If you ignore reception issues, if you're holding it wrong on the 4, or not sending audio on outgoing calls, the 4S, along with overheating and charging issues, the Wikipedia makes it look like the 5S was just a collection of problems. The camera destabilizer and structural issues with the iPhone 6, the hissing background noise, the exploding batteries in the iPhone 7, and screen burning the iPhone 10. Issue. And more recently, connectivity and charging issues returning with the 10s, and issues with the OLED screen in the iPhone 12 with dark scenes. We'll take a look at the evolution of photo capabilities from the iPhone 10 to the iPhone 12, and then the latest iPhone 13 and iPhone 13 Pro Max. And then we'll look specifically at how the video capability has evolved in the current generation. If you want to skip to the big reveal, there are real improvements that make the iPhone 13 Pro one of the best, I'd argue the best, at video, but the improvements over the non-Pro iPhone 13 or previous generations, the iPhone 13 Pro, probably won't affect most people, most of the time. For stills photography, things are, as they say, different. Depending on how you want to shoot, process, and deliver stills images, you may get the best value out of the iPhone 12 Pro or the non-Pro iPhone 13. Of of course, the iPhone 13 Pros will have you covered in either case if you shell out more cash. Speaking of value in cash, at the end of the video, I'll give you some buying advice if you're new to the Apple world and looking and may not be familiar with Apple buying patterns. Let's see how the various phones compare when we look at a static scene. Looking at the still life shots and good lighting with ISO kept to about 80 to 100, the cameras on all the iPhones look quite similar. 
to nitpick, there appears to be a bit more texture on the iPhone 13 Max, while the added JPEG noise on the iPhone 10 is most obvious in the shadows, in particular looking at the pig's ear. The Pro models include RAW, which retains more fine detail and less baked-in saturation. You can add that to taste and post. Otherwise, to my eyes, the iPhone 12 Pro Max, 13, and 13 Pro are all basically equivalent here. Even if the 13 Max picks up a little more detail, it's not going to be noticeable in everyday shooting. If you're only shooting JPEGs and don't need the telephoto lens, you're not going to be disappointed with the non-pro phones either. As expected, there's a little narrower depth of field if you look at the Starship model behind the right Ninja in particular, as we shift focus. There and the texture of the Ninja's head are good areas to check comparative sharpness and detail. The same follows through to video, although the iPhone 13 and 13 Pro add cinematic mode and iPhone 13 Pro adds ProRes. Cinematic seems particularly fond of the pig's face, and focusing was occasionally a fight with the phone. The blurring process is very much object-focused, which means that the phone may not let you do certain shots, like start from one end of the ruler and shift to the far end, although this depends on how it exactly recognizes the scene and its contents. Regarding ProRes, does it help improve quality at all? I'm not sure. It can maintain more detail, but the results from the interest scene seem to maintain very coarse lines, either the lens sensor, or most likely the processing pipeline, or a combination, was already dropping fine detail, resulting in unnatural contours being preserved compared to the H265. In other situations, the preserved detail will be clearly beneficial, and with added color information, I test the Max against its standard H265 encoding under really bad changing lighting. Remember, ProRes isn't raw, and the iPhone camera app shoots 422HQ rather than 444, so there is subsampling of chroma info, but the ProRes does maintain more detail and associated noise, where H265 would encode large solid blobs of flat color. In general, I left the phones on auto white balance, but applied an exposure bias in the studio shots. Although in the interest scenes, I applied some small corrections to bring the videos closer together. The iPhone 12 Pro Max, for whatever reason, had shot noticeably cooler than the other phones. We've come a long way since the first camera phone, since Ericsson offered a VGA add-on for its T68 phone 20 years ago, or the Nokia 7650 integrated one the following year. Let's take a moment to reflect on how mobile phones themselves have changed in that time frame. From low-res, $500 unlocked candy bars that had T9 predictive input, to retina displays with touchscreens and on-screen keyboards. The T68 supported calendaring and contacts with wireless syncing over the cell network, or locally. It had an email client. It could send and receive files wirelessly with pretty much any Bluetooth-equipped computer, regardless of the operating system, and even functioned as a standard Bluetooth mouse, which made it useful as an impromptu presentation controller. The non-Sony Ericsson T68 M phone even included Tetris. That all changed with the introduction of the iPhone and the modern smartphone five years later when Apple announced its new media device would have a touchscreen at four times the resolution at only about one and a half times the size. And dropping the physical keypad, it added a two megapixel camera, but otherwise have all the same features of the T68 minus over air syncing and file sharing, or the ability to sync with anything but Apple software for that matter. And it couldn't be used as an input device to drive presentations or low third party applications, although you know, J to me wasn't so hot. To be honest, the current Nokia and Ericsson's phones had moved on to S60 with multi-language support, uh, C++, Python, and Perl. And they had nominally five megapixel Carl Zeiss lenses, but I digress. Instead of $500 for an unlocked GSM phone where you would need to go through the process of comparing and choosing a carrier separately, with the iPhone, things would be easier. Since Apple would sell you the iPhone for $500 and sign you up for a two-year contract with AT&T at the same time. Right, so that's basically a roundabout way of highlighting how little innovation the original iPhone actually brought to the market, at least from the tech consumer point of view. We moved from basically a duopoly between Sony Ericsson and Nokia, which were based on Symbian, but with UX and hardware differentiations, to a duopoly between Google and Apple. The experiences offered by other major manufacturers, like Samsung, don't really drive much themselves, and most of the hardware innovation for Android ends up on dead end branches in the platform's evolutionary tree. I'm still bitter about how mismanaged and directionless Nokia was, where it could have led to a three-way push for innovation for a while, or, or that something more productive wasn't done with Palm's IP portfolio. Those are all things that really could have driven more innovation and competition earlier, and potentially driven the platforms to be more open. In contrast, Nokia tried to follow Apple and Google into the world of integrated services, Nokia accounts and app stores, 
hurting the user experience in the process, which in part because of the features and configurability they supported compared to the nascent Android and iPhone platforms, and more so because they never needed to care before, was already not great. That's the distant past, however. The truth is most people don't miss the features that got dropped, and carriers have adapted to the subset of features Google and Apple have decided to support, that they've decided are important for the user. A not completely negative inversion of control, but frustrating as carriers remove features that were useful on what are now legacy phones from their network. Seriously, to mobile, you're removing the feature that blocks SMS messages that I use with my Nokia because it blocks SMS messages? It's less remarkable that Google Fee is laughably bad with a non-Android, non-iPhone device. In 2004, I remember standing in a Vodafone store in Tokyo, staring at the spec sheets of a Sharp phone highlighting its 5 megapixel camera and comparing it to the compact digital I was carrying with me at the time. Rather high end for a compact, Pentax Optio 555. When Steve Jobs announced the 5 megapixel camera on the iPhone 4, he said it was going to be the best camera that most consumers would own. Each generation continued to improve, but it wasn't until the iPhone 10 that I really found that the shooting envelope was getting broad enough to consider them as good enough compared to contemporary dedicated devices. The top line specs have gotten better with each iteration, especially since the advent of the not a pro line. And Apple's continued improvements in tweaking of computational photography, the things which were only being done in research settings 15 years ago, and custom silicon to do it efficiently. If anything, this synergy of hardware and software is the biggest differentiator from Apple today and Nokia in 2007, or even the Android's ecosystem. This on the business and manufacturing side is where the iPhone was and is most innovative. Common components meant large orders driving down prices and opening up things like touchscreens and time of flight cameras to increasingly cheaper phones. The computational processing that Apple's added, well, some of it is gimmicky. In general, though, a lot of it follows the philosophy of have the system do common things decently that would take a lot of time to do at least as well. There are countless how-tos about masking out backgrounds, applying Gaussian blurs to the background layer, sharpen the foreground, then dodge and burn the subject's face, or you could just use portrait mode. Personally, I still find it requires too much thought and awareness to make it useful as a snapshot tool, and doesn't look natural enough to warrant the avert attention and effort. Cinematic mode is the same thing. It's neat that it's there and that it's being worked on, but there are so many limitations, and we'll get back to that. But with its limitations, I don't think it's a killer feature that a lot of people make it out to be. Likewise, ProRes is an interesting addition, but I, I think the iPhone 12's addition of 10-bit Dolby Vision was a much bigger deal. Does anybody actually plan on making heavy use of ProRes as an acquisition format on the iPhone 13 Pro? The extra storage required for the all intro encodings, the subsequent transfer time, it doesn't seem worth the trade-off compared to creating proxies or honestly just processing H.265 if you're working on small projects. Even 10-bit is accelerated on the 11th generation Intel chips. Well, 8-bit's been accelerated for years. I know the overly aggressive compression is the biggest fault I found with the iPhone's video, but using ProRes as the solution, it's like boiling the ocean to cook a fish. There's been talk about Final Cut Pro coming to the iPad Pro for a couple of generations now, and with the M1 and now E15 chips getting ProRes decode and code support in silicon, that pretends an iOS or iPad release. Final Cut relies on ProRes to generate proxies, so dedicated silicon for encoding makes sense. And now that the cost to get ProRes into hardware is sunk, adding it to the camera app is cheap, and it adds a bullet point to the spec sheet on what has been a generally panned update on the iPhone 12 Pro. It's been 15 years since I was standing in that Tokyo shop considering swapping my dedicated camera for a phone, and with the iPhone 12 Pro and iPhone 13 Pro, we have, in my opinion, the first camera phones that are honestly raising that question again. We've elevated from the iPhone 10's good enough with the integration of ProRAW to devices that return creative control to those who want it. And the iPhone 13 adds photographic styles, which adds creative control to those who previously lacked the ability or time to tweak results. Yeah, to me, I see it as gimmicky because I want the raw file, but I also realize that this is a really cool feature for a lot of users who at most might just want to apply a preset curve. They can dial in their preferences and not need to do any post-processing to get the look they want consistently. Of course, dedicated cameras, even ultra compacts, have had the ability to control things like saturation, contrast, and sharpness for two decades. And the iPhone 13 Pro's camera still lags behind the Android-based Panasonic Lumix DMC CM1 from 2014 in terms of sharpness, depth of field control, configurability, and user interface. If you're looking for a raw image and not needing night mode. I know some people and 
videos have found the iPhone's interface easy to use and intuitive. And while it's much improved since getting the iPhone 10, you can now set an explicit exposure offset, for instance, I still find it frustrating, and in some ways it's getting worse. Adding more features and configurability to the camera app has made it easier to get the shot you want, that's great, but it's also resulted in a more crowded interface. This made it difficult to focus on the left ninja in the samples above since the lens magnification controls occluded it on the screen. I ended up using a self timer which allows you to refocus after starting the countdown but then apparently triggers a burst mode so I got a lot of unexpected extra photos of still life scene. The camera app has a lot of very small touch targets given the amount of controls the latest version is stuffing in so the difference in usability between the 6.7 inch max screen and the 5.4 inch mini screen is noticeable. It's more frustrating dialing in the precise value you want with kinetic scrolling, or you might mistakenly change the wrong setting, like frame rate, without realizing it registered as a tap. You can set certain options to always reset to a default value when you initially open the camera app, although with the Pro models, there are some options which conflict with each other, which can be confusing. Specifically, Pro Raw and Live Photo are both independent options, which you can default to on, but they conflict. You can't take a live raw photo. If you select both, the Pro RAW default will be overridden, much to my chagrin after a day of testing the camera. I would have rather had it recognize the Pro RAW option and then default to live photo when the RAW was disabled. To me, that's the only way these make sense as separate options, rather than as a single select option. But I'll admit, Apple UX designers and I, we often don't see eye to eye. Otherwise, there wouldn't be liftoff movement on kinetic scrollers. To summarize, it's not as good a stills camera as the DMC CM1, but I've already done a video on why that doesn't really matter. Let's get back into the video features. And before we talk about cinematic mode, let me just highlight that the picture profiles you can set for stills do not carry over to video, which is a disappointing omission, especially since there's no raw option for video and, and the Apple Center profile is going to be baked in as your only option. Speaking of carrying over, I'm mixed on how many settings are mode specific. I feel like especially the exposure offset should be global. If I'm shooting a snowy scene or other scene that is biased away from middle gray, if I'm switching from photo to video to cinematic, I, I need to update the exposure bias three times, one for each of those modes. This means one more thing about which to worry, focusing on exposure each time you switch modes means you might miss a shot. And honestly, it was the reason why I did not check the frame rates when I did the intro videos. For that matter, while we're on the subject of switching settings, I really wish there were an option to hide the certain modes that you don't want to use. Things like the panoramic mode, which somehow I find the phone opening into, I guess because I swiped the screen too hard from the right, and which leads to all kinds of levels of frustration as I realize I'm not actually taking the photos that I thought I was. Right, what else is wrong? Well, let's look at syncing. I've updated my PC to Big Sur 11.6, which is currently the most recent release of Mac OS. And I've been updating iOS 15.0 on the phones and the photo sync is frustrating. What I expect is plug in the device, hit import all and delete after import. And all the media, photos and videos taken on the phone, we get copied to the PC's photo library and removed from the phone, just like it says, import all, delete after import. Taking videos on the 10 and 12 or photos in Pro Raw on the 12 or JPEGs on either. And that's exactly what happens. Special media doesn't get removed, however, since presumably Mac OS Photos app doesn't fully support them. Bursts in portrait mode appear to be left behind, but the show is already imported. Worse, cinematic seems to be ignored. It doesn't appear as something that I can copy off the device. So let's get to cinematic, how it works and how you work with it. Here we are, back to cinematic. We haven't really talked about it. When I first used the portrait mode on the iPhone 10, it was clearly inferior to a physical low depth effect. It seems some critics have warmed to it, but I still find the effect to be difficult to pull off if your subject isn't well isolated already. Even then it often looks all right on a six inch screen held at arm's length, but on a larger screen or at a four by six print up close, there are jarring boundary effects that ruin the effect. Cinematic mode is the same way. First off, it's worth noting that you have some limited creative control on device after capture to adjust focus and depth of field from the photos app on the phone. If you find the effect particularly jarring, you can increase the depth of field effect to smooth out the transition from in focus to out of focus areas. With respect to focus adjusting, unlike a Lytra camera, which capture the light field or multiple angles of light, the underlying lens of the iPhone has one actual focus point. And post capture adjustments will be limited tweaking the computational blur on top of that. It may be obvious, but 
I don't like the cinematic effect. At its default wide aperture setting, it's particularly awkward, with parts of the image being unnaturally blurred and changing ways that just don't physically work. Adjustments can snap in and out like a wipe rather than a smooth pull. It just doesn't look good in my opinion. With the increasing size of the 13 Pro sensors and resulting larger absolute aperture, the actual physical effects, in my opinion, are a reasonable trade-off. If you're shooting on a multi-function device, you need to realize the trade-offs in the standard video and photo modes on the iPhone 13 Pro are impressive in that context. Cinematic mode videos have other issues as well. It doesn't seem like the photo app in Big Sur, at least on my Intel-based 16-inch MacBook Pro and Mac OS 11 6, understands cinematic videos. It doesn't see them as valid files for syncing when I plug in the iPhone 13 or iPhone 13 Pro. It's as if they don't exist. Instead, how I found I need to transfer them is via AirDrop from the phone to the laptop. The first time you try that for a video, it'll tell you that the video needs to be processed, which can take a while. It creates a standard QuickTime video with the depth of field effect baked in and no longer editable on the target device. If you edit the original video on the device and change the depth of field effect or change any of the settings, you'll have to reprocess the video and it'll take a while again and send it back out. Interestingly, in iOS 15.1, if you connect the iPhone to sync, it'll bring up a dialogue indicating that some videos need to be processed, but the videos don't sync yet, but it seems like a limitation that will eventually go away, possibly before final release. If you sync photos via iCloud, that may also be a workaround, but I have that disabled given the lack of end-to-end -end encryption, and there's some contentious upcoming changes in iOS 15 related to iCloud photo sync. The iPhone 13 continues Apple's relatively recent focus on serious image capturing capability. No, it won't replace Pro Rigs, and yes, of course, you could use it professionally. Should you get one? I don't think either Cinematic or ProRes are worth upgrade on their own. I think Night Mode is still the best use of computational imaging on the iPhone. It's effectively a smart blending of several images, and the end results look natural beyond aggressive noise cancellation and unavoidable movement. For the first time, the telephoto lens on the iPhone Pros are also capable of Night Mode. If you found yourself taking lots of shots at night, zoomed in, it may be worth the upgrade. But before you jump in and raise your hand, let's look specifically at the telephoto lens on the iPhone Pros. The iPhone 13 now has the field of view equivalent to a 77 millimeter lens on a 35 millimeter film camera. That's a nice bit of extra range compared to the 65 millimeter on the Pro Max, now a 3X zoom versus 2.5X zoom, and just past the far end of the quintessential 2470 standard zoom. If you currently are using the non-Max iPhone 12 Pro, well, this may or may not be what you want. The iPhone 12 Pro had a 2X telephoto lens, or a 52mm equivalent, which is just a bit longer than a normal. If you happen to believe the Nifty 50 is the ideal field of view to capture scenes, the upgrade to the iPhone 13 may be a disappointment. If you don't care about the telephoto lens, what about the non-pro line? The iPhone 13 essentially has the best camera, the best sensor lens and image stabilization from the previous generation. You just don't get the pro raw functionality. You get to tweak the picture style for the first time on an iPhone, you get a better battery, and if you like the size of the mini, it's probably going to be the last mini you'll be able to order, so there's that. Personally, while the mini's small screen makes changing settings in the app frustrating, it's still my favorite form factor. The Max is useful if you're using it mostly as a controller for other things in a semi-mobile manner, e.g. controlling a DJI drone. The big, bright screen gives you a better view of the remote images and the has big, easy touch targets. I don't much care for the middle of the road size, which I still find too big, but unfortunately is rumored to be the most pocketable size going forward. There are pretty significant improvements over the Pre-12 phones. The introduction of Pro Raw alone would be a reason to drive adoption from an earlier model to the current Pro models. While Night Mode, improved image stabilization, and light capturing ability would all be reasons to upgrade to either the Pro or non-Pro models. All right, so what's the best way of buying a new iPhone? Apple rarely lowers their prices, at least until a new model is released, which means usually you want to order as soon as you know what model you want. Towards the end of a model year, third-party sellers, mobile telecoms, companies, or other authorized resellers may start issuing some discounts. So it's worth checking out those options if you're getting to that point in the year, but only buy from an authorized reseller or directly. There's a lot that can go wrong from authorization locks to poorly done refurbishments. If you're buying a used cell phone or iPad with cell service from instance, Amazon that's been used or refurbished from a third party, it could be blocked from connecting to the cell networks. It's just not worth the headache. If you do buy a lot of Apple stuff each year, like a new computer and a phone each year for you, family members, whatever, consider jumping through the hoops to set up a business account. If you spend a few thousand dollars a year, you could see savings similar to those from the refurbished discounts on new custom ordered equipment and accessories. 
If you don't generally spend thousands of dollars, Apple's refurbished store is a good place to look. Unlike third-party sellers, if you buy a refurbished from Apple, you can still walk into an Apple store, get it repaired, and chances are it's actually been better tested than anything that's been new. Finally, recently, Apple and wireless carriers, at least here in the US, have been offering seemingly unreal trade-in deals. For instance, I could trade in my iPhone 10 with its degraded battery for a new iPhone 13 mini at no cost after trade-in and via bill credits, and without any form of carrier lock on the phone, unlike buying directly through Verizon or financing via AT&T. The trick with saving money on the trade-ins in recent years has been to stick with the base models. 128 gigabyte iPhone 12 Pro Max gets the same rebate as the top of line 512 gigabyte model. And depending on what provider you have, incentives might even mean that it makes sense to upgrade within a year. If you're on T-Mobile's Magenta Max and have a base model iPhone 12 Pro Max, you're looking at over $1,200 in trade-in values and statement credits which is enough to cover a new iPhone 13 Pro Max and likely the tax. Even with lesser incentives, it may be worth considering the comparative costs of a battery replacement or add-ons of Apple Care, if, depending on the age of your device or how long you plan on holding it if you're buying it new. The iPhone SE is unfortunately getting a bit behind in terms of features and supported wireless frequencies. But if you aren't looking for the Pro features, a refresh there, which hopefully comes soon, could be an economical option. Apple's selling a non-pro iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 mini at a $100 discount. For $100, I'd lean towards the iPhone 13 with the larger battery and better camera, but you likely can find or will find better discounts from other authorized sellers or Apple's refurbished stores. I don't think the iPhone 11 is a good value. Remember, the base model here is 64 gigabytes, meaning Apple's only discounting at $50 from the iPhone 12. Of course, the other way to save money is just not buy into the cycle to begin with. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.